think it's important that we understand that entrepreneurship in general, regardless of the industry, is a roller coaster. But roller coasters are supposed to be fun. The economy is collapsing and I lost my first half million dollars. And then it just went off the cliff from there because no one was spending money. So that was like, wow, I think this is over. Then I looked back and I had to connect a lot of dots of the things I didn't do that I ignored or I put off to the side because I was just making money. You want to eliminate inefficiencies, redundancies, but you know what you really want to eliminate? You. You want to eliminate you from the business. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS. But my guests come onto the show to authentically share the highs and lows of creating a successful business and how they turn things around in their business to create a better business and a better life. Now, today's guest, we have a lot in common we've discovered already because he has lost everything, including his house in the 08, 09 collapse. But he did this whilst having six children under the age of four. Fortunately, he has rebuilt and he is now running a successful business that helps other business owners. And he's also the best-selling author of Escape the Owner Prison. So today he's going to share with you how using a Marine Corps mindset can create success in business. Richard Walsh is the CEO of Sharp and the Spear Coaching, as well as a successful author. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you, Deborah. Appreciate it. It's great being here. Yeah, so I really enjoyed reading about what, what you went through. Not, not because I enjoy seeing people suffer, but I think that it's all, I love people who've actually had the highs and lows and are prepared to share that because often I think when we listen to podcasts, when we see social media, we can get kind of this wonderful opinion that the world is all roses and everything's fine. And, and I've very rarely met business owners who've had that beautiful, you know, non, no issues with growth throughout their period. Yeah, I don't think that's actually possible. You know, there's a reason, Deborah, I don't really work with startups. Yeah. I have a startup program they can do online. It's like a 16-week program, and you do that. That's what I tell them. They don't have enough scars. They haven't hit the bumps. They don't, they don't have value in needing help because they haven't done enough. They, they got to fall down a bunch of times. You know, you got to lose a little money. You got to make some mistakes. You gotta do, we all did, okay, some little, some a lot. I did a combination of both at different times. So I think it's important that, we understand that entrepreneurship in general, regardless of the industry, is it's a roller coaster. But roller coasters are supposed to be fun. I guess I actually like roller coasters and I think that's that's the joy of it, right? Because if you can when you experience the lows, you actually get to experience the highs in a completely different way, in my opinion. Yeah, and I'm really built for I don't know if this is right. I'm I'm built for suffering. <laughs> I'm just it's just I ran cross country. I'm like this big dude who ran cross country in high school, you know, like running 10, 15 miles a day and 5Ks and 10Ks and stuff. Then I went in the Marine Corps, did all that. I'm, I just trained, trained, trained a little bit. Then I became a boxer and I'm doing all that, right? So I'm getting in the ring, you know, and, and just getting punched in the face every day. And then I became a black belt and doing all that. So I think I just enjoy suffering. I think I've come to that conclusion, like, if I'm not suffering. I must be doing something wrong. I don't know. Uh, I said, so does that also tie in with having lots of kids as well? I don't know. Yes, that well, that first four years, Deborah, I'm telling you, my wife, one day, my son's, I think it was his fifth, just turning five, maybe, just turning four or five. And I'm sitting on the couch, and people are over, and we're having, a, you know, all the friends are over having a party, and I've got the thousand yard stare. You know, she comes over to me, and says, What is wrong with you? And I go, I, I haven't slept in 10 months. I think I'm going to die. <laughs> she goes, Just suck it up. You know, and she's doing like 10 times the things I was with the kids, you know. I'm, I'm running the business and trying to do the night shift so she can rest and stuff. And it was, that was brutal. But after that, it got better. Hey, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. So, you know, I've read your bio and it said that you were at the peak of your career. And then, of course, the collapse happened and, and you lost everything. Tell us a little bit about Richard in general. Like, go back as far as you want to, but tell us how you got through that, where you are today. Yeah, so... 
I got out of the Marine Corps in 1987 and then started working because you got to make some money. So I got a job. It was an incredibly amazing job. It was swinging a pickaxe, digging trench for $5 an hour. And I swung a pick all day, eight hours a day. Really stepped up from the Marine Corps there. So I'm doing that and I'm thinking, wow, this is like my future, you know, but there's always more. I'm pretty optimistic. And someone asked me to help them with a side job. He said, hey, can you do this for me? In Arizona, you lay granite, so crushed granite or three-quarter inch and instead of grass. So you put that. Well, we got, they had 35 tons worth. They needed to be wheelbarrowed into the backyard and spread. I said, I can do that. It's working. That's what I do. And But here's the beauty, Deborah. You know what I did? I made $1,000 in a day. I did that job. I shoveled it from the street in the wheelbarrow, all around the back, spread it to the whole thing. You know, about 10 hours in 100-degree weather. But I made $1,000, and I went, I just made $1,000 doing what I'm doing all day for $5 an hour. I made 50 and I made 1000 I think I'm going to go into business. <laughs> that was, I'm like, I think I need to work for myself because it's obvious, right? So that started it, a little landscape, and that turned it into a water feature business, so the custom waterfalls and ponds, backyard ponds, higher-end stuff. Really grew that scale that was kind of in the very beginning of that industry, if you will. Scale that became nationally recognized, won tons of awards, publications, all that stuff. I really was an artist, pretty spectacular work that I did. And that was going like crazy. I was doing wonderful, right? Now, 08, 09 comes. So I'm in about 18 years, 19 years now. And the economy is collapsing. In November 5th of 2008, I lost my first half million dollars. And then it just went off the cliff from there because no one was spending money especially not on a water feature in their backyard. They could wait. Okay, I'm a luxury item, 100%. So, so that was like, wow, I think this is over. <laughs> like, but at the same time, I'm like, I did a lot of things that we can talk about, but a lot of things, because I, I, I actually told people, oh, I don't, I don't blame the financial collapse. I blamed, well, why didn't I survive a financial collapse? Then I looked back and I had to connect a lot of dots, a lot of dots of the things I didn't do that I ignored or I put off to the side because I was just making money. I was building things. I was being an artist and getting paid well for it. And I became an internationally recognized steel sculptor. So I was going doing this world-class exhibits and commissions, and I'm just like, well, who can stop me? I'll just make more money. It's, it's no big deal. But that house of cards came down when the collapse hit. It forced my hand, and I didn't have the things in place to weather that. So it was bad. Lost everything. Anything I had to sell, I got 25, 30 cents on the dollar for, and it was pretty new stuff. So it was bad. So if you, you know, and I was not in the position to save it, lost the house, everything else, had to relocate, figure out what, what I was going to do. But the big epiphany I had was I woke up one morning during all this as things were crumbling around me, and I was thinking about my kids. So I've got these six little kids. And when I come home at night, if I get home at seven o'clock or nine o'clock, whatever it is, because I'm working all these hours. They they drop everything and run and attack me. As they're all six of them, just whatever crawling me, whatever they're doing at that time. It was so cool. I'm like, well, that's great. And then in the morning, or if I stopped like in the middle of the day, grabbed some lunch, started heading out. One of my sons is like race, chasing after my truck down the driveway as I'm leaving, crying. You know, because I'm leaving. I'm like looking in the rearview mirror at this, going, "You gotta be kidding me." I'm like, like that. Like I tell people, well, that doesn't move you a little bit. Then you got some bigger issues that I can help. You know. But I was like. Okay, here's the issue. I'm so focused on business that all I'm going to do for my kids is they're going to, that's all they're going to learn. Business first, business first. Not your faith, not your family. They're going to have terrible relationships. They're going to have destroyed marriages, right? As they grow older, they're not going to be able to do this stuff. So I'm like, that was it. I'm like, I'm done. I'm going to shut this down right now. I'm not going to do this anymore because, because it has become me. My business had become me. My identity had become me. And that's really bad for a business for a lot of reasons we'll get it, maybe we can get into, but, but that was a big epiphany for me that really kind of changed the direction of what I was doing at that moment and what I wanted to do in the future, even though I had to figure out how to do that with nothing. So that kind of brought us up to speed and now it was time to rebuild, relocate, rebuild. And I started that process and of course grew a couple of new businesses and I did them right this time where the business didn't own me. I said, well, how do you do this? I really had to study, look back. How do I not, how do I make a business that doesn't need me for the most part, right? The, the big goal of everyone. That's why everyone gets in business, right? They don't get in business to be a slave to it. 
they don't want to serve the business. The business is supposed to serve them. It never happens. What happens, Deborah, is they get in, and here's the thing I haven't figured out how not to do, work really hard the first two years. Okay, you're going to put in a ton of hours, get those scars, get those bumps, get those bumps. But then, next thing you know, it's 10 years in, and you've repeated the first two years five times. And that's why you can't scale, because you're stuck doing everything, not delegating, doing all the stuff you're supposed to do. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that, because I did that for like 20 years, pretty much, right? So so I'm I'm the dumb one. Okay? It's just, you talk about it in the Marine Corps way, it's kind of, you're a little thick, okay? It's a little, it's a little abrasive. But so I'm like, I'm not going to do that, so how do you do that? So that's the plan I developed. And we'll start it over again. Then, like, let's build this differently. So there's a whole approach to that. But and that kind of brought us up to speed. Then I people started asking me, how'd you do that? Like, you lost everything. How did you come back from that? And so I said, well, I did this. Like, I got into the mentor role, right? So we got a mentor. Then I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur, though. So what does a mentor need to become? A coach. Okay. He needs to get paid. Okay. <laughs> so mentorship is free. Okay, you're helping and being nice and giving some advice, sit on a board or something. Coaching is a paid position, you know, so let's really help you. I don't like part-time. I don't like, here's a little bit of advice and whatever. I'm talking, let's get into it. Let's build programs. Let's do this for your business and make things happen. So that pretty much brings us to where we're at today. No, that's fantastic. I think, again, we have similar kind of backgrounds because I was the same. I actually um, went and did some mentoring and really loved it. But it's like, yeah, this is not, this is not a business and I am an entrepreneur. Uh, it's what I do. It's I, I love um, I love business. That's the thing I love most: business and people. Okay, so that's cool. So we've got through this. I've got one question I need to ask, and this is just a personal thing that I'm just thinking. You talked at the beginning about you know being a kickboxer and, and sporty, and then all of a sudden you're winning awards for creative artwork. It almost feels like they're at opposite ends of of the spectrum. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's funny, Deborah. I am a I am just a What's the word? A walking paradox? I don't know. I'm just, I am just never been, I've always, I don't want to, I can use the word odd, right? But I've never, I've always been a contrarian. So I think I was born a contrarian. You know, I remember my mother telling me, she goes, you know, we had to take you to the doctor when you were, because like, you never cried. You just sit there and entertain yourself and you didn't, I'm like, well, I didn't need you. Even at birth. <laughs> I'm an odd duck. You know, I was born old, I think, you know, something like that. But, but I think it was really that pursuit of what's going to challenge me, what is next, you know, how do I push myself? Um, and the art thing is really, really interesting because growing up and in school, the public school system, yeah, I was told I'm not anything. I mean, it was a terrible experience, but you're no good. You're not, you know, you're not an artist, you're not that. You better just, you know, go get a trade job or whatever, you know, back in the day like that. And what's funny, Deborah, is you look back and I'm doing all this artwork, right? And literally I had a huge project I did for this Garfield Park Conservatory in Chicago. And I was thinking one day, and I'm thinking about those teachers and the things they said about me and to me. And I said, you know what? I'm making more in this one commission than you'll make in 10 years teaching. <laughs> I said, so yeah, you were wrong. Okay, and that's why I don't listen to people, which it can be good and bad. There was a time where I should have listened and I didn't. But but it really caused me to like, just like the Marine Corps, I went in at 17 years old. I wanted to go in. I'm like, I, actually, I tried at 13 years old. But then they said, I'm in the recruiter's office. Like, I'm ready to go. How old are you? I'm like, and I was a big kid, like six foot then. You know, when they go, well, I'm 13, but I'm ready to go. Oh, son, you just come back to hand me a little folder and some stickers. You come back when you graduate high school and we'll get you right in. I'm like, oh, man. So sure enough, I got a 17 and went to the Marine Corps, did that. Uh, great challenge. My son now just joined six months ago. He's in the Marine Corps now, so that's pretty cool. He's a tough kid. But but then it was that that I got out and I said, oh, I want a box. I had a friend who boxed. I go, I want a box. So I went down to the gym and got, and his name was Dave, and he was from England, actually. And uh, he was South London kickboxing champion and all this kind of stuff, right? So we're talking just straight boxing. That's what I want to do. So he got in. I got in. He's a monster. Okay, just a monster of a big guy, really knew his stuff. And he's just playing. I can't land a glove on him. Chasing him around the ring, I can't lay a glove on him. And he looks at him, pop, he hits me. First, first shot, left hand, he breaks my nose. Okay, I'm keep going. I'm okay. And the next, goes a little longer, you know, I'm bleeding all over the place. And 
pop, hits me with a left hook, and and Deborah, I kid you not, my mouthpiece out of my mouth, out of the ring, and across the gym. Okay, it's just I'm just like, oh my, I have two black eyes, you know, broken nose, all this stuff, and so I went to work at the time because I was working at a bar as an assistant manager. This was right out of the Marine Corps. Also, the general manager was, what happened to you? I go, oh, I was sparring with Dave. You can't do that. And I said, oh, I'm doing it. I'm going back tomorrow. I'm going back tomorrow. I'm doing it again. I said, I won't work here then. I'm going to do this. So I'm a little, I guess the word might be obsessive, but I'm an all or nothing kind of person. So I want mastery. I want to, if I get in something, especially if I can't do it, which are most things, I do want to master it. So I'm kind of driven that way. So whether it's water features, it's steel sculpture, I taught myself how to weld. I did this, next thing I'm doing world-class stuff. So that's kind of, I just think it's part of my makeup. I think it's actually part of entrepreneurial makeup. I mean, I think the really good entrepreneurs, I mean, I, I'm, I'm similar in terms of I, I'm a musician, I speak languages, I, I love the art of business, and I'm also a scientist by trade. But it was just, yeah, it was just I, anything that was put in front of me, it's like, I want to learn more about this, and then I want to be the best I possibly can. And it's just, I think for most entrepreneurs, that's part of our spirit and our drive, isn't it? It is. And you know what else? There's a, there's a downside to that, and that's the SOS, the shiny object syndrome thing. Yes. Because then we get pulled towards opportunity and this, and we have to rein our, if you're coaching, you got to rein these guys in, you know, and I have techniques for that too. I can share with you, but it's, it, that, that's a problem, right? It's a gift and it's a curse. Yes. At the same time, you know, so you have to learn to master it. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and people who do, and people take ADD, ADHD, and they master it. I had a multi-billionaire client who he definitely was ADD. And he was like 70, mastered it. I mean, obviously, right? He's a self-made guy, but you had three minutes to close the deal with him. And it might be in his driveway waiting for his driver to come pick him up. You know, but you had three minutes. And whatever it was, that was a conversation. And, and you do it. And you close a deal. <laughs> so he was, and he would just show up and say, jump in the car. And he picked me up and drive me, take me to some of your jobs. And just drive me around. I mean, he's just that guy, but he mastered it. Right? He was doing so many things. Yeah, very impressive. Hmm, beautiful. Okay, so the Marine Corps. I know nothing about the Marine Corps, so I'd love to hear. So they wouldn't let you in at 13. Fair enough. You went back when you were 17. Yes. Was it, was it um, easy the second time round to get in? No, because my mother didn't want me going to the Marine Corps. She said any branch, because my brother, who was a year older than me, was in the Army. And then she's like, any branch, not the Marine Corps. I said, but I have to be the best. And Marines are the best. They're the few and the proud. They're the elite wife fighting for us. This is, I have to be that. But I was 17. I needed her permission. She had to sign the paper. So I get what I want. So I brought two recruiters over, and they sat on the left and right side of her on the couch and browbeat her for three hours to, until she signed the paper. <laughs> They're the best salesmen in the world, Marine Corps recruiters. They don't get any better than them. You know, but, but it was funny. And then she, you know, she wasn't happy, kind of crying, signed it, okay. And three days later, you know, I'm shipping off to the Marine Corps, you know. So, and it was good. And that was a great experience. I mean, it was tough and not tough. It was tough and it, it's, a, it's a lifestyle change. It dealing in structure, but very, you know, alpha directed, right? So just a great thing to do. I could never have been a lifer, you know, do it for 20 years, 30 years, which I, that was never going to be me because I don't, I don't think I could do anything for that long, you know? Uh, You've been married for 25 years though, haven't you? I have. So I, yes, so we, we still can change, right? We can still change. So it's good. Yes. Yeah, so the marriage thing has worked out well. So I got that. If I got to pick one, that's the one I want. If, if nothing else goes away, I want to keep that one. We got, we got a lot of years left, so it's going to be good. But yeah, so that, that, was, that challenge was great because it, what it did was, what the Marine Corps really does, Deborah, is it really just pulls out who you are. It doesn't change you into something. Like people think you go and you become this, you're over this gentle, nice person, and now you're a savage killer. They don't do that, right? What it does is take what's already inside you and brings it out. It shows you what you have. You know, my son is an, another example of that. We, he got the nickname from our pastor. He was doing a, he got an Eagle Scout for a Boy Scout thing, a ceremony. And he said, he said, D'Angelo is, I call him silent power because he never talked much. If he said, he never said three sentences in a row. He was a big reader and stuff and just quite, but he's a great athlete. People would talk smack, you know, about the, I'm going to beat you this and that. He says, oh, and he's just going, he'd beat them and just leave. 
He wouldn't talk to him. He just goes. So he, and the, the name was perfect sound of power, but he went to the Corps. He graduates boot camp. Okay, we're seeing him. He's in the School of Infantry. Now he talks and he talks and he's got, he's got even more purpose and challenge now. It's just brought him out of him. So he's like a different person. He's really who he was, but he's verbalizing it now. You know, he's more, he's more assertive and things like that, right? So it really wasn't, they didn't change him. They just brought it out. They woke it up inside of him, which is fantastic, you know? So I told him how to box. He wanted to box. So I had to teach him that before he went into about two years of boxing. Again, he wanted to do things. I tried to get him to do other things, but he really wanted the box. So we did that and he did very well. So it's just, I, I think a lot of times that, again, it brings it out of you. So it did that for me and really taught me persistence on like a new level. It's like a different kind of persistence. You know I mean? I want to go to Marine Corps. I got in Marine Corps, right? Whatever it takes. You know, 13, 17, through my mom. So I always kind of had that, that grit to push forward. But what they did, they put an element of, and I don't really have a better way to say it than life or death. It's like you're going to do it or you're going to die. Okay, because that was kind of the, the options. If you don't achieve this, you'll probably be dead. So let's achieve this so we don't die, right? So, and that, I love that. Like I'm one of those weird guys that negative reinforcement really challenges me and those kind of challenges make, make a big difference for me and they push me. So I carry that into the business world. So, and again, my first 20 years, the downside of that, Deborah, was I'm going to do it all by myself. I just dip my shoulder. I'm pushing through. I'll, it took me twice as long. It was twice as hard, but I succeeded because I was unwilling to get help, take help. Again, great people all around me offering me simple little bits of advice that I wouldn't take. I got this. I mean, what does a multi-billionaire know that I don't know? I'm just a jarhead, you know, got out of the core and I started the water feature business, but what does he know? All of the stuff he told me to do, he was right. I just didn't do it. Okay, so it's just an unusual mindset. And that mindset has just forged me all these years. You know what's really strange about it, Deborah? People will see me, and they don't say, were you in the military? They'll say, were you a Marine? It's a very different thing. That's the difference, right? Because you're not an Army, but you are a Marine. And it's different. But people like, and I don't know why that is. I've been out for like 35 years, 40 years. You know, but people are, they, they still see that. I, that's the way I hold myself, the way I walk and present myself. But it's, it's, it's very interesting. So it does affect you for a lifetime, which is, which is interesting. And so thinking about, you know, the things that you did learn in there, I mean, I have to say the whole, you know, do it or you're going to die is a pretty strong motivation to get things done. Pretty strong why, isn't it? But what else did it teach you that you were able to take into business and that you now use to help with the business owners that you help? You know, really, uh, a really good thing, and it's as simple as this may sound, I don't know if people think of it, but chain of command. Chain of command. It's like structure. Because what I teach now in my coaching business, like, so let's use job functions, okay? So, like, you have to do something, right? Because they talk about delegating, right? Oh, you need to delegate. And you know what they do? People just tell people to do something and they walk away. Called abdication, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, you know, okay, that's going to fail. Okay, they're going to quit, they're going to leave, and you're going to be worse off tomorrow than you were today. But, but it taught me, like, well, what does that actually mean? Because that's the thing the military is great at. You have rank, and you have duties in that rank, and you have things you can do. And, you have, and when, if, if, a, if a platoon is down to a corporal and the corporal gets taken out, you have a lance corporal. The lance corporal steps up from that position. Every position then fills in the position above it. That's the training we get. We're not afraid to step up. In Vietnam, a lot of times you had an E3. That's a Lance Corporal been in a year. You're not running whole platoons, right, in charge of 50 guys. You know, so the life and death, you know, because you that that's what they instill in you. Next guy steps up. You step up. You step up. One goes down. The next one steps up. So I really like to apply that. I don't want people dying on business, but I, I, want, I want that ability that we, we understand the rank and the position. We, it gives them a path where to go, right? So if you're just going to, you know, you know, we all know the dead end jobs and all that stuff, but if you're able to build a business now and I help really design businesses where the people on the team are actually growing both as in competency for their business and I do it, I want them to grow and improve as people. 
right? Because if they can become better people, not just competent workers, that changes them for the good, right? They take that home and that affects their families. And from there, their families go into the community. Now you're starting to affect a lot of people with your business. If you have 20, 30, 50 people, you really do that. And my goal is to help 10,000 business owners, right? Create more freedom, profit, and impact. Okay, well, that could be millions of people it affects just because I want to make them better people. So that's part of my, my job functions, my levels inside positions. And that, that's if I learned from the Marine Corps as well because they encourage that. People don't think they do, but they do. There's so much you can do in the Marine Corps to make yourself a better person from education, training, all kinds of stuff. So the, the military really has that, the Marine Corps especially, really has that dialed in. So that's an easy takeaway because you are in it and you're just trained that way. Yeah. So let's delve a little bit more into delegation because I think yeah, the, the, the thing you described before, and I, I'm, I think we've all been guilty of it at some time, where we kind of go, great, I get to delegate, but what you really do is just abdicate all responsibility and kind of give it to somebody else and then get really shitty with them when they don't deliver what you thought they were going to deliver and they get upset with you and before you know it, become a, a massive issue. That's abdication. Tell me a little bit more about what delegation should look like and how that worked both in the Marine, but also in, in business as well. So what you want to do, here's what, the, here's what people don't do. They want to delegate a, a position, a job, a task, you know, a, a whole line of things, right? So and the problem is, again, they just tell someone to do it. And I think the biggest, the, the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make is they think other people are like them. They think they think like them. They're just going to take it on. They're going to create a system for you because that's what you do, right? You come in, you make it better. You become more efficient. Well, they don't ever do that, okay? Because the ones that would are working for themselves doing it, making the same mistakes you're now making, thinking someone else should be like them, right? So they're not going to be like you. So here's what you must do. You have, this is the hard work. This is what a lot of guys forget in those first two years. If you do this in the beginning, it'll change everything you do for the most part. You're going to, so you have a position. I don't care if it's site foreman or it's your, your uh, office manager and administrative position. You're going to build out what we call the job functions. Here's what you do specifically in the job. It could be seven things. It could be 50 things. You know, not every day, but here in your entire job, you're going to do this, right? Wednesdays, you do this. And Thursdays, you do this. Every day, you do this. So you have the functions. Here's what you do. Next column is how you do it. This is my way of doing it. You may come with competency from doing a different business, but you're going to do it our way. That's the problem. They think because they're competent, they've done it before, they're going to do it your way. They're not going to do it your way. They don't know how to. You may have different software you use. That alone is going to throw them off because they're used to working in this platform and you have a completely different platform now. So now, so now you have the how to do it. And then the third column is going to be the training of the how. So you create the job functions. Here's what they are. And that's, I introduce job functions to the potential candidates on the first in-person interview. So we have a whole series we develop and stuff, but you don't put that in your, in, on your Indeed or your job wanted. You don't put all those job functions and let people read all that and tell them you're going to only pay them this. They're going to think they should be getting, you know, you know, $10,000 a day for all the stuff you got labeled out because they don't, they can't put it in perspective, right? They don't understand you do this one thing once a month for it, 20 minutes. <laughs> and that's a job function. So, so they, they think they're going to be worked to death, right? So you don't do that. <clears throat> and you say that for the interview. But once you have the, the what, then you have the how, then you have the training for the how, right? And the training for the how is part of the systemization process, right? So, and that's in video form, maybe it's manual form. Maybe you are working with someone, but they have a bank to go to and train. So they know how, so everyone's trained consistently, right? So you may have five people in the same position. You may have 50. Well, they all need to be trained the same way. They all need to be trained to do the how to perform the what, right? So we want to make that all duplicatable for every position in the company, right? Now, when you have that, now you can bring the guy who's competent, really good at what he does. You're like, man, this guy's an A player. An A player is not going to come to a hot mess. They're going to come where they go, oh, this is all lined out. Now you have total accountability. All these jobs, we can't say you didn't know. Oh, no one told me. Oh, that's right here. It's number seven. Okay. So, and you've been trained and you've signed off and all this stuff. So, so they can come and they can, they want to work in their lane. I don't care if it's sales. They want to, they're closers. 
They don't want to create your sales system. They don't want to make a presentation. They don't want to build that stuff up. You do that and say, use this presentation I've created. Here's how you learn it. You'll be up to, I, I did it for my roofing company. I want to take someone who knew nothing about a roof, okay, uh, except that it's on top of a house. That's the extent of knowledge I wanted on purpose. I'm like, and in seven days, when you go give an estimate, they're going to think you've been doing this for years. And it's all is video presentations. It's the actual script. It's all scripted out. They can learn that, review it, review it. Seven days are closing deals for 10,000, 15,000, 20, like they've been doing it forever as duplicatable, right? Follow it, role play it. So we built that out as part of the system. Now they know what to do. Now they're armed to go out and do what they do best. And that's close deals. They, no one wants to mess around and build your business for you. Sorry, that's on you. And that, as you just said, I mean, that makes it scalable too, right? Because now it's not reliant on one person who's got all this knowledge, but actually there's a system that they can follow. There's a training process they can follow, and they will be able to do that within seven days. Absolutely. Imagine every position in your company like that. That's the company I want to buy. I want to buy a company like that. I don't want to buy a company to reinvent everything and show them how to do it right. There's a time for that. If I want to grab some market share at a very low price, I can find good good email lists and customer lists in a disorganized business because I know how to flip it. I can get it up to speed very, very quickly. That could be good. But my ultimate goal is if I'm going to sell, if I have an exit strategy that says I want you know, $5 million at this time at 10 years, blah, 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 and I want to get that, I want someone to come in, negotiate the price. I get my $5 million, They hand me a check. We shake hands. I go out the door, they come in, and nobody knows it was sold. That It runs so well by like no one knows. Now they can tweak and do whatever they want. It's their business now, but they don't want to. What's attractive is a business that's profitable that they can own, right? It's like, wow, I don't have to come in and fix everything. I can just encourage everyone to keep going. <laughs> so, so it's just kind of part of the plan. And it's kind of what you talked about right in the beginning, right? There's sort of three things you're trying to help people get, and one of them is freedom. And you cannot get freedom when every, everything in the business relies upon you. Yeah, it's, it just doesn't. I mean, you are, it is, and I said escape the owner prison because that is what it is. And, and let me tell you how, if you, you've written books, right? Aren't you author? Okay, well then, good, good for you. Well, what's the hardest thing? If it's an email, it's the subject line, right? Hardest thing to do is get a good subject line so they open the email. A book, the title, incredibly difficult. So I had 27 working titles, Deborah, when I wrote my book. Now, I wrote my book very fast, three weeks. Okay, I had an editor, and she's like, you're fast. She didn't even know what to do. I got done so quickly. You know, I got a bestseller. I hit bestseller in 10 categories on Amazon, all this stuff. But, but I'm like, with the title. So I went with, I had 27 working titles. I went with the 28th. I had to come one more. It was this kid. And I was at a track meet. My kids were running with another buddy of mine who owns a manufacturing company. He said, I was like, Troy, what do you think about this title? Escape the owner prison. And he just looked at me and goes, that resonates. That's good. You could see he's like, yeah, I, I'm, yeah I've been there. I'll be aware. And, uh, and I was like, done. Then it was the contractor's new way to scale, regain control, and fast track growth while loving life. That was harder than the title. That subtitle. So if you're writing, stand by. Like, don't think about your title. Just write the book, and then have someone help you. So my editor like moved one word in the subtitle and fixed it. She was the best editor ever. A good editor can move one word, add a comma, and it's, it's beautiful. You know, you don't see these changes. But yeah, so that really was. You just get trapped, and that is small to mid-sized business. That is like the commonality. The much, I mean, they're home. They're thinking about it. waking in the middle of the night. They're thinking about. It. They're with the kids and the wife and the phone rings and they're stepping out of the room because it's a customer call. It's an employee issue, you know, and that is just, that life just destroys everything around it. It really does. That's the, that's the bad part of it. And the trouble is we love business. You're like me, right? We love business. I love it. I'll talk about it all day. I'm talking too much now about business, right? So it's just, but, but, but we don't realize what it does to everyone around us. That's right. That's what I say. I mean, it's a, uh, it's great that we we love what we do, but we have to be very careful. I mean, I've got a, I've got a husband who's actually the polar opposite of everything about me, and so he is a, he's an actuary, he's an introvert, he's a, you know, risk averse. He doesn't talk very much, and he doesn't, you know, he works nine to 
let's say nine to three, nine to four, whatever the, the magic thing is for that day. And he says, I get paid for my brain. So as long as I've done my work, I'll just leave whenever I'm ready. And he switches off completely. Like he doesn't even think about it when he comes home. He plays his music and does other things. Yeah, I know. But, and, and often he will, you know, he'll end up ringing me up and saying, hey, are you coming home anytime soon tonight? It's like, why? What time is it? Well, let me give you a little, let me give you a word of encouragement on that. I've always loved this. I heard a, the guy say this once. He goes, if you two were identical, one of you would not be necessary. Okay. <laughs> So just let that soak in, okay? Just let that soak in and go, yeah, okay. It's all right. Yes, now it is good. But anyway, yeah, so um, but it, I was thinking about sort of some of the clients that I've worked with in the past as well, though. It's like that they they may well be loving their business and doing what we do and loving it. But the reality is like you see them, they they try to take a holiday and you know, and they want to take three or four or five weeks off. And they just can't because there isn't the systems in place for them to actually be able to leave it and be and they're always worried about what's going on. Whereas if you've got this set up correctly, it's going to be able to run without you. Yeah, and it has to. It just has to because they, they won't get two days into the, that vacation, that holiday, and they're calling the office or the phone's ringing. You know, it's, I had a client literally, and he speaks all over, right? He's the best at what he does, one of the top three guys in the whole country that does what he does. And he literally would tell me, like, I'm speaking on stage and my phone just buzzes, buzzes, but it's the office. It's his people calling. They need this, need this, need this. When I started with him, I'm like, so I, I took this. I'm like, this is insane. You know, and he's doing like $10 million a year. But it's like if you watch an ant farm that wasn't ants, but it was just absolute chaos. So they're bumping into each other instead of being over. That's what it looked like. In the, like everybody was doing everything. So I'm like, well, what's going? No, 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 no. That's not how this works. <laughs> let's let's give them certain things to do. Like, let's start breaking this down so we really piece up. And like, it was five months, and it's like six months later. He goes, I, I went for three days. I'm like, they never called me. The office never called me. Like, I got to bring my family now. We got to spend four days after my lecture. I did my whole speaking thing. We four days. We're at the dunes. You know, we're doing all this stuff. It was just with my kids because he was ready to give the whole business up. Two in the morning, sitting outside the, the building in his truck, crying. He's like, I can't do this. I can't. This is, we're growing so fast and doing everything just when there was no, there was no order whatsoever. It was just more, 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 more. And to see that turnaround and watch someone's life shift, because he's brilliant at what he does and he needed to not quit. You know, he needed not to quit. Like he needed someone to come. Here's, you can't just tell him not to quit. You gotta go, this is why you're not going to. Let me help you. Let's get this dialed in. And uh, that's, that's, that's part of the joy of what we do when we're able to, to help people. Like so we've talked a little about freedom, and freedom obviously is important because we do have lives outside of work and we have people that are meaningful to us. Talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit about profit now, though. So I know that people often think, oh, yeah, but if you're going to bring in all these systems and we're going to train all these people, it's going to end up costing more money and how do I make more profit? How, what would you say to that? So what, what I, what's interesting in my program too, and I'm working with people, we don't usually talk about money much, you know, because I'm like, well, watch what happens if you do this. And it isn't like it's all this money to be systemized. Like that's not systemization. You know, you're not bringing in a bunch of robots and stuff. You know, that's not what you're doing, right? It's, it's structure and order is what you create. Like we talked about the job functions, everything else is building things like that. So people can operate in these spaces, right. And operate completely. So I said, when you do this, you'll see what happens. It's increased efficiency, right? It's, 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 it's reduced waste. Okay. You got higher performance, your, your team, the people on your team, your employees will become assets instead of liabilities. Because usually when it's all chaotic, they're liabilities. Right. The people are like, because they're not going to show up. They're not going to do the job. Well, they're costing you money, but they're not producing because you haven't built anything they can produce in. You just keep telling them to figure it out. And that's not their job. So that's costing you a fortune. As soon as you straighten that out, all of a sudden, not just your gross revenue, your real net profit begins to increase. And that's what we really care about. Don't get, don't get, I, I, it's the worst score card you'd have is gross revenue. That's a horrible scorecard. I mean, I have clients who they're doing 10 million in gross revenue and they're not even taking home 100,000. 
I, I, I always, I find it really challenging because I do a lot of work with the Entrepreneurs Organisation, both here in New Zealand and in Australia as well. And one of their criteria is all about gross revenue. If, you've, if you're creating more than a million US dollars in revenue, you can join EO. And it's just because you make a million dollars in gross revenue does not mean that you're actually making money. Right. It, it's true. This guy said, my, my, I'm going to throw my little brother under the bus here and he's okay with it. I'm gonna throw. He started a landscape business part-time, great salesman. He's a, just the greatest salesman ever. The kid's just, he works for a fertilizer company like the whole Western United States. He's the top guy, but he started a landscape company. His first year, he did a million and a half dollars part-time. Like, so I'm like, when he calls me, I'm not making any money. I go, how are you not making money? It's landscaping. I go, you should be having at least 300 in the bank. You know, he goes, no, I don't, I don't know what it is. So I start walking him through it. He's got 37 employees. I'm like, 37? What are you doing? And one of them was my older brother. I go, well, definitely got to get rid of him. Okay, so, but it was, it was kind of funny. I said, okay, here's what you're going to do. Because he's his wife saying, you got to get out of this. You know, you're just, and I said, okay, tomorrow, go fire half of them. And you know which half, you know who they are. Get rid of them. I'll be out this weekend. We'll go through the books. We'll flip this. I'll flip this thing in a heartbeat. We'll get you organized. We'll get this thing going. You know, I'm like, like you see, but you can make money, but you don't know what you're doing. It took me 20 years to figure out I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. He did in the first year. I go, you're blessed, man. Look at this. You screwed up like this right in the beginning. You are so lucky. You know, so we can, we can turn this around. His wife wasn't for the turnaround, didn't want to do it. So he kind of just put the kibosh on it and went back and selling more stuff. And he's happy. It's all good. You know, not everyone's an entrepreneur. Uh, but that was a great example of not paying attention. You're focused on gross revenue. You know, so there's a great saying that I learned years ago from a mentor of mine. It's a gross profit feeds the ego. Real pro or gross revenue feeds the ego. Profit feeds the family. That's how you got to think about it. You know, the more you keep, because you got you got to keep, and that's everything from tax strategy, right? You need tax strategy. You need you need again turning your people into assets instead of liabilities, right? You need production. You need efficiencies. You know, you need the systemization. You, know, you need to have that stuff. So very important. I wanted to back to your guy who had a lot of people who were growing really quickly and they were running around all doing a little bit of everything. For some people, when I start working with them, we talk about having, you know, accountabilities and keeping people very narrow in terms of what they're doing and, and having their, their systems and processes. They, they worry that it's going to be add sort of silos and not create the um, environment that's required, but simplifying it down actually has quite the opposite effect. And people are then doing what they love and they're in an area that they can really excel at. So tell us how, how that went from having all these people running around doing bits of everything to suddenly having some real structure around what they were doing. Because the good thing was he had good people. Okay. And that was, I'll just call it coincidence. Okay. Because good people are hard to find. But he just had the right people, but they all were willing to do everything. Now, think about that. Can you actually get someone who's willing to do everything? So you're starting with something good. I said, you just, as the conductor of the orchestra, you're not performing. You're not pointing to the right instrument to perform at this time, right? Because that's what you are. You're the conductor of the symphony. They're making all the music. And you're just telling me a little louder, a little softer, a little faster, a little slower, right? You're, you have the interpretation of what they're doing. So think of it that way, right? So once we did that, because I started to, well, what do they do? Okay, well, he's really a, an operations manager. Like, do you have that position? He goes, well, I kind of have that position, but then he's doing this and this. I go, well, he shouldn't be doing that and that. That's this guy's job. So you have an operations manager. Now you have a production manager. So you have an operations manager and a production manager. He's dealing with the guys mixing all the... The, they're not keeping care their biologicals, mixing all the biologicals and doing kind of the real hardcore, dirty work, you know, if you will. But he orchestrates all that. And then you have a GM. She was doing a lot of things that she just, she's going to take your place. She's going to make sure that the operations manager got his stuff. She's getting bills paid, right? She's making sure the, that that system is functioning. You understand what's going, you're collecting the money you're owed. Again, you get, you get excited about your gross revenue, you forget about collecting the receivables. Okay, because you think you're riding high, and next thing you know, 
you don't have any money in the account. Cash flow. I was going to say, yeah, cash flow becomes a massive issue. You got a million and a half out there. People have neglected to pay and you've ignored them and let them do that. So that's a problem, right? So by, by taking that and dividing this, first you go directly to the people. So what I do in our room is I go directly to those people. I don't make the owner. Yeah. I don't make the owner systemize the business because no owner is going to do that. They, they want their business systemized. They don't have the bandwidth. They're not going to come and systemize all these positions and all that stuff. Never going to happen. But I tell you what they will do. <laughs> they will pay someone else any amount they want <laughs> to do it. Right? You come in and do it. I would just name your price. Okay. So I've learned a system. What I do is I help each position build out the systemization. I work with them so they get additional buy-in on that. But here's the caveat. I go, it's not part of their job. So if they're making 100000 a year, they're not going to systemize their position and get the same money. We're going to put a bonus. We're going to put a time frame. We're going to do what we call strategic goal setting. We're going to have, it's going to be a 60-day goal. We're going to have this resource, this sort of this resource. If you get hung up, you're going to talk to this person. We're going to have this reason. We're going to get the complete. And when you do that, you're going to get X. Big bonus, a couple thousand dollars this vacation, whatever you're going to get, right? So they, they have skin in the game now. They also get buying because they get to help create a system to make the company run better, make their job better, that they can now focus on that lane. So it's real easy actually to get them to love doing that. So now it's a little extra work, but they understand the outcome. The big thing is like what this is going to do. I explain the outcome, not just you weren't systemized, you are systemized. It's like the outcome is what this does for your job and your life. Like, how are you going to be able to operate every day? Because when every day is a mystery, which is how most positions are, did, did I do the right thing? Am I supposed to do that? Should I help John? Because he looks like he's struggling, but am I allowed to do that? They, they don't know what's going on from day to day. You know, that is high anxiety. That's like flinching every time someone moves, right? Because you think you're, it's like you don't know what's coming from which direction. So once you build that and you help those people build it out, it's amazing. It's just this, this calm comes over the business. And you go there and everyone's just like, Richard, you know, you just walk through like, it's just so good to be here. You know, they just, they just love you. And I tell them, you get a question, just call me. You know, so it's kind of a unique way of coaching. A lot of people don't do it that way. But I'm very tactical and strategic combining. And, uh, and that's really how it works. That's how you really help the owner. Because again, they aren't going to do it. They're not going to take this on their plate when they're running a multi-million dollar company out promoting and selling and being on stage, when are they going to systemize their business? You know, so it's just, you know, it works for me. It works for my clients. And uh, I, I, like I said, Deborah, that, that outcome is amazing in a short period of time. Yeah. Okay. So we've got freedom. We've got profit. We also, you also talked about making a difference in terms of impact as well and amplifying your impact you can have. And we've already talked a little bit about that because obviously, as you build better people in the organization, obviously they're affecting the wider community. Therefore, you're um, having a much bigger impact. Is there something else in there for you? What does when you talk about amplifying the impact? Yeah, I think so. That 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 making them better people, affecting the community, affecting families is part of it. But what I'm really doing is training them how to do business differently. Because there's like this one way, and everyone does the one way. And the focus becomes very, very different because you aren't focused on gross revenue, right? That's not it. You're not, you're focused on like, again, improving your people. What is it? Rewarding your people. You're not about how much can I keep of everybody's money, right? It's a very different mindset. You start to go, who can I give to? So outside of my business, how do I make an impact? You know, we, we did the people part. That's good. But like, You'll see these companies, oh, we give $50 million a year to charity, blah, 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 targets and whatever these are. Okay, that's great. What charities? Like, what are you really doing? You know, there's some things, and I can be a little bit of a curmudgeon on this stuff, but they, someone comes up with a little pink bucket and they want, to, want me to donate to breast cancer awareness. And I go, well, where's the money going? And the kid's like eight, right? And I'm beating this poor little eight-year-old down. And he's like, well, he's just, you know, my mother had cancer. And I'm like... Is the money going to your mother? No, no, I I don't know where. Oh, okay, well, I I don't put money in buckets. I don't know where it's going. Okay, so I'd rather go to the hospital 
to the oncology department to a man in a bed who's getting chemotherapy or whatever he's getting and give him money because he's going to get the whole hundred dollars instead of 10 from the hundred they give to this foundation. Because, you know what I mean? So from a business, that was my little rant, I'm done now. <laughs> but from, from a business standpoint, I can choose who I help. Maybe it's a foster care agency who places children and they need more, right? They need more funds to do this. Maybe it's a, a pregnancy crisis center. I can do something with that. There any, I can pick the charity. My people on the team can pick the, pick the charity. What are you guys interested? What can we do? Because I want to take 5% of my profits and donate it. That's all. So that's impact. But you do it locally. You don't give it some giant organization that's, you know, with, they call it the March of Dimes. They call it the March of Dimes because they only, you only get 10 cents out of the dollar. You know, they get to, get to use for helping people. So like, I'm just big on like, you know, and I'm also, about, I don't like to brag about it. It's the whole right hand, not what the left hand's doing and that kind of stuff. And I just want to make an impact that, that matters. So you have that ability. So there's the impact you can make as a business. You're in a community. You have a building. You know, even if you're a 100% remote business, you live somewhere. So do that. You know, when, when a big corporation, like when Boeing moved to Chicago from Washington or wherever they were, Everyone's like, well, it's just their corporate headquarters. You know, yeah, they're not building planes here. But do you know what that means when the corporate headquarters comes to your town? They have all the money. They're given to charities. They're given to local charities. They're doing, that's all part of their image, right? So there's a huge benefit. You know, now, yeah, they could build some planes down the road. Okay, and that's good. People will get jobs. I'm talking about the good that they can do. So people don't really think that way. So you have so much power as a business owner to make change, right? To really direct it. And it's your money that you get to say where it goes. It's not taxable income that the government decides where it's going to go. You get to learn how to keep as much as you can, then take that user for good. So for me, that's the big impact. Okay. Gosh, I could really talk to you all day long, but I know that it is late in the evening for you. And I know that um, you know, we try and keep these things reasonably short and succinct. Before we kind of shoot off, just can you give me three top tips? What would be the three top tips that you would give to any business owner who may feel like, yep, they've they've either hit the ceiling or they're feeling overwhelmed. They just, you know, they, they don't feel like things are going well. Here's what I want them to do. And man, we didn't even get to this. With This will be a whole nother show. So I'm going to keep it really short. They need an exit strategy. Okay. Best time to do an exit strategy is before you start your business. Okay, a little counterintuitive for most people. The next best time is right now. Okay, because here's why, very quickly. You go to the end. Remember I was talking about earlier, hey, I want to get out of this in 10 years. I want X amount of dollars, blah, blah. But also at that same time, well, I'm making seven figures a year from my salary as the CEO running my company. All right, well, if I sell my company, I don't have a million dollars a year anymore. Well, that's not really good, is it? <laughs> That's kind of, that seems to defeat the purpose. So what you want to do is you, as part of that exit strategy is how are you going to create that passive income? How are you going to accumulate assets that are going to generate income to match that seven figures? So, okay, you need $83,000 a month. Well, what are you going to do is you can go into real estate. You're going to buy that commercial, residential, whatever your investment strategy might, vehicles might be. Now, as you're reverse engineering from the end, because you go to the end where you want to be, how many houses do I have to buy a month? I know houses and how much do you have to generate? How much stock? How much Bitcoin? I don't care what you do. Whatever it is, like you can quantify it, right? And now you can take that active business income because you don't need a million to live. Pretty sure. A million a year you can do. You don't have to use it all for living. Just saying. It just, and if you do, you got to reevaluate a few things. But take a lot of that active business income, build assets, build assets. So if you have a 10-year exit strategy, you have 10 years to build assets. Now you get to 10 years. Oh, look, I have $83,000 a month of passive income coming in. This guy wants to give me $5 million for my business. We're going to shake hands. I'm out. He's in. No one knows it's sold. Wow, that's a pretty good deal for me. <laughs> now I can take that $5 million and put it into assets and make even more, right? And I can continue all that. Or I can stay in the business, move the goalpost, because I'm having so much fun and making great money. I reach my passive income goal. Well, let's make more. Let's keep going. And now I can now I can stop taking the salary from the business, reinvest in the business, and grow the business as well with that. Because I'm probably the biggest drain from a money standpoint on the business because of my salary, right? So that's the first thing. 
Okay, and I'll stop it there. Like I said, we can go on forever. Number two is very simple. It's three words. It's automate, delegate, and eliminate. Okay, so we want to automate whatever we can. In in today's society, a lot of a lot of great things. Automation is a big term. Actually, it covers a lot of different things and different ways to do it. But you get it's 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 systems. It's software systems. It's it's call services, if you will. It's uh, virtual assistants, right? All these things you can automate and build to help your business run more efficiently. Delegate, we spent some time on that in this. We still want to delegate properly. Let go, let go, let go. Give it to people. Set them up for success, then put them into it. They'll love you for it because they probably don't want to be around you all the time anyways because you're who you are, and it's just they, they'd rather see you Go golf or something, you know, just get away from us. Let us do our jobs. Okay. And then the eliminate part. So obviously you want to eliminate inefficiencies, redundancies, but you know what you really want to eliminate? You. Okay. You want to eliminate you from the business. All right. Work yourself out of here. So you're spending your four to 10 hours a week on high level stuff, what I call your 5%, the 5% of the business only you can do. That's your goal to get to that level. It's all vision work and new markets and things like that. Work on that stuff. So that's number two, okay? Number three is what, what I call the five Fs. That's F as in Frank. It's faith, family, finances, fitness, and friendships, okay? So when we talk work-life balance, again, the term I hate, okay, these are the things you have to balance. Faith, family, finances, fitness and friendships okay you gotta hit because if you can't do those obviously you don't have enough time right your business is still owning you you have to be diversified you have to build relationships businesses relationships if you're really good at business because you built relationships in all different levels whether it's sales relationships uh partner relationships vendor relationships whatever it is you're building relationships so um Faith, of course, people have all different, you know, views on that. Uh, the finances, you got to pay attention to your money in your business and your personal life. You got Parkinson's law. If there isn't a place if that's not designated to go somewhere, it's going to evaporate. I've seen a lot of money evaporation in my life, personally. Okay, so you got to pay attention to that stuff. Fitness, you got to be healthy. You know, you have to do something. You can't. It, it just it makes you better. It makes you a better leader. It makes you a better performer. It keeps you sharper. It's a great distraction. I like to train. I like to go very hard. I'm a little nutty. I go very, very hard in my workouts. So no one talks to me in the gym, which is a plus, right? Because he looks kind of scary doing what he does, hitting that bag and doing strange things. So that's good. But it's a part of it. And then your friendships, you got to have some friends. I don't have a lot of friends, you know, by design. I have a very small circle because that's a, that's a high bar. I said a very high bar for, you know, there's, there's different levels of acquaintances and friends and colleagues and like that, but the, the close friends, they're going to be a small number, but you need them. They're confidants, right? That kind of thing. So you want to think about that. Plus, you might also have your board of advisors, your informal board of advisors you put together when you have a big question and you need real advice because there's wisdom and a multitude of counselors. You can have those people too. That's in the friendship ring as well. So that's so. So those are my top three. That is fantastic. So exit planning, automate, delegate, and eliminate, and the five Fs. Gosh, there's some gold in there. Hey, look, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to have a chat with you. Um, if people want to get in contact with you and also get hold of that book, would you just like to tell us how they'll do that? SharpenTheSpiritCoaching.com. You can send me an email. You can book a call. You can get tons of information. That's good. If you want to escape the owner prison, just hit Amazon. You can find it on there and order it. But what I'd like to do, because I'm on with you, Deborah. Anyone who's watching and mentions your show, they go on my website, sharpenspiritcoaching.com, sends me an email, say, hey, I heard you on Deborah's show. It was awesome, because you know it is. I said, I will send you, my, I will give you the audio version of my book, Escape the Owner Prison, for free. That's fantastic. Hey, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. I um, I look forward to uh, following you with interest. I'm going to read that book myself and hopefully we'll remain in contact. And when you actually physically come to New Zealand, you might want to come pay visit. I know. But I love being on here. This was so much fun. Really, really great conversation. I appreciate it. Same here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>